Johnny K. He is the program director of K Earth and the Wave. He's here for you. Take notes, write down questions, and pick his brain. All right? He's here for your benefit. Make him feel welcome. Make him feel exhausted when he leaves. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I just want you to know that there's no uh, question that you can't ask. I mean, if you want to ask about money or anything like that, I'll answer as honestly and forth with as I possibly can. Um, I just, uh, how many people are interested in television versus radio here in this group? Okay. And how many people are interested in radio? Oh, terrific. All right, very good. I also have a television production company. That's why I asked. So I, I've done a lot of commercials over the years. I, I directed Dick Clark the last 18 years before he, uh, he had a stroke, and uh, we have a good working relationship. So I can answer some questions on that side of the fence as well. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, usually I leave people with some thoughts before, uh, uh, before I wrap up. The, the little hour, but uh, I'll, I'll begin with, uh, there are a lot of assholes in this business. Don't become one. You're going to deal with these people. At one point in my career, I was telling Dick Clark, we were shooting a commercial, I said, you know, I'm going to quit because I can't take this guy. And he says, do you think that I have worked with, I've liked everyone I've ever worked with? You know, I work with some of the biggest ones in the industry, you know take the check, you know, and they come and go, and just hold your breath, and you, usually things will change. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Also, in this industry, if you, don't, if you only mildly want to be successful in it, go do something else. Study something else, please, because uh, you have to want to do it from the tip of your head to the bottom of your feet and be permeated with the, the, you know, the, the passion for the industry in order to make it. So, you know, love it. And one other thing I would advise is try not to, although it's probably too late for many of you, and, and that's okay. Try not to put all your eggs in one basket. These industries have a way of, uh, I got to remember we're on tape today, of, uh, you know, defecating on you. And then you have to, you decide to leave, but you're not trained to do anything else. So if you're going to study anything else, study business. You can go in the, you can be a, you know, sell stocks, you can sell real estate, insurance, you can do so many things with business. And this is every day, I'll bet you most of you consider yourself artists, and that's a great thing. But every day these businesses become more and more, I mean these industries become more and more business-like. And that's taking some of the fun out of it. Anyhow, given that, okay, I'm here to answer any question, anything at all. Just shout it out. Yes. Uh, in, in your position as, as program director, do you find yourself uh, being the uh, the main report for your board operators? Um, or is that under operation? It used to be that way. I mean, uh, ultimately, if I hear a board operation problem, I can determine whether they continue as a board operator or not. I have a great assistant at the radio station. Her name's Claudia Rubio. And Claudia, I give her that assignment because there's only so much one person can do. As long as the station's operating fine, yeah, she handles all the board operators. She'll schedule them. Uh, she will uh, interview them when we need a, a new board op and bring in the final three and let me interview them. Sometimes I make the decision, sometimes I just say, hey, who is it? Who do you want? Uh, a follow-up, if I might. Mm -hmm. um, since we focus a lot on board operations here, what are some of the things that a board operator should be able to know, do, uh, skills that they need to have, uh, person or tech or characteristics that they need to have to be successful as a... Yeah, what are the requirements for a board operator? Um, well, first of all, you, you need to know your FCC rules and regulations, all right? We had a, uh, we just had an incident uh, with one of our CBS radio stations where um, a tower light was out. And uh, it's costing us about $10,000. <clears> CBS is a company known for not paying fines, meaning we will contest it and uh, defend ourselves in it. This was indefensible because uh, the FCC saw it, just happened to be driving by on a freeway and saw a tower light out, decided to call the FAA, which is part of your rules and regs. You're supposed to let the local airports know that, hey, we got a tower light out and let all the planes know. 
Uh, that had that call had not been placed. Uh, so the, the uh, inspector came and visited the facility, and while he was there, he said. He saw that it was working, it had been reported, everything was fine. But uh, he said, let me look at the logs for that week. And when he looked at the logs, the board op had just been signing off, which is an easy thing to do, because you go over the remote control panel, everything looks the same, you know, 9,000 times out of 10,000. Um, but no, the equipment was working properly. It did indicate a light was out, but he was signing the log, or she, I don't know if it was female or male, um, saying and, and qualifying that everything was correct. And so that resulted in the fine. Is that person still working? I don't know. I don't know who it is. Um, I would imagine so. I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't make those decisions. But uh, yeah, you have to know your uh, FCC rules and regulations. That's, that's really important. So much of radio transmitter work is now automated. Uh, and machinery takes, and computers take over and do a lot of things for you. But you have to look and actually read the instruments once in a while or the monitors to realize that something is indeed wrong. Wow. What else can I tell you? So following up on what you just said right now with the chief engineer, the chief engineer, does he, he do, does he, what does he do around the radio station? other than, you know, making sure that some equipment is working properly. Is there anything else that he really does? The chief engineer in today's world, if you're in a, a larger size company as we are here in, and most companies are in Los Angeles, he does some of the handiwork but he's not soldering every wire. You know, he, he's thinking more big picture. Like right now, uh, CBS owns K-Rock, Jack, Amp, KNX, KFWB, K-Earth and the Wave. I program K-Earth and the Wave. Um, the chief engineer over at the Venice property, we're putting in all new, all new boards right now. So he likes to design that work and supervise it. He does some of it himself, but he can't possibly do everything. That's why there's a staff of engineers below him. Engineer, while we're on that subject of engineers though, it's one of the most secure places to be in broadcasting. If you want to work decades and get to a retirement age, become an engineer. They watch all kinds of disc jockeys come and go, and salespeople come and go, and general managers and market managers come and go, but they're the ones who stay. And they watch the program directors come and go, by the way, as well. So it's a, it's a nice, secure position. The, the caveat to that is that it's not the highest paying position in a radio station. But, but you can live comfortably. There's nothing wrong with the salary. It's just not going to, you're not going to get, get in the high six figures or seven figures with that. What else? Yes? Well, do you think you could talk a little bit to, to them about what a day in your life is like as a program director? What, what do you do? Oh, a day in my life, OK, <laughs> as a program director. Um, well, because I program two radio stations, plus I'm on the air. I have to do the all-night show because we're tracked on K-Earth. So Monday through Thursday mornings, it's me. Uh, first thing I do is I come in, I read music, because every day we have a music uh, computer system called Selector, a software program. And I read the music for the next day. My assistant inputs it into the computer and prints it out for me. And then I go record midnight to 5 for the next day. Sometimes I record two shows, three shows. I might do four shows in a day just to get it off my plate for that week. Um, after that, there's a lot of putting out fires. You, know, you, you, you want to see people. You want to go visit the air talents as they come and go and make people feel good about their positions. And, and let's face it, we work in an industry of egos, so you've got to stroke their egos and you know, compliment them when they deserve it. Um, but... There are so many fires to put out. There, there are meetings. I have to attend marketing meetings and promotion meetings and administrative meetings. And, it, and that's what takes you away from listening to the radio. That's why I've created, at this point in my career, I have a day each week where I don't work from the office. Because if I work from the office, I'll never hear what we're broadcasting. I have to be out of the building and drive streets. Just like driving over to Pasadena today was a great experience. I got to hear it like a normal person does in the middle of the day, and that's an unusual experience for me. So, what are you listening for when you, as a program director, when you're listening to your own station? What are you listening for? 
Oh, good question. What, what does the program director listen for? The exact opposite of what most real listeners listen for. The music? No. Okay, I'm listening for everything between the records. Okay. It, 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 there, it has never been, this is, I used to have a little programming booklet that all the announcers received when they came to work for me for years. I, do, I don't hand it out anymore, but they hear the speech anyhow. It, it has never been the amount of things a radio station that does right that makes it number one. I used to program, I programmed Coast for, I was affiliated with the station 21 years, programmed at 17 years. Um, we were number one for a year and a half. In Los Angeles, that is a feat. I've gotten k to number one twice now. Um, every radio station, including college and high school radio stations, do things right. You stumble into doing things right. It is the amount of mistakes a radio or television station makes that prevents it from being number one. The station that makes the fewest mistakes wins in the ratings game. So I'm listening for errors. And as my jocks will tell you, I'm, I'm famous for picking up the hotline and calling them. But it's never mean. It's just, hey, what happened there? Why, why the audio duck out? What's going on? Does the engineering know that? Whatever. What, how come you played the same commercial twice? Didn't you realize that? You're not listening. But listeners are listening. They go, what the hell is he doing? So. Always listening for errors, because if you can eliminate the errors, you're going to rise to the top of the pile. Yes? Okay, uh, so how far in advance is the program done, and how much time do you allocate for the commercials? Um, the, pro uh, the music programming? Yes. Uh, the, the music programming, like last night, I read through Sunday. I read, uh, my uh, assistant uh, program director and music director uh, generated all the logs through Sunday. So I read all those, made my corrections go, no, this song doesn't fit here, it should go there. These two don't sound good together. This three-pack doesn't make any sense. Uh, never play two females in a row. There are certain top 40, you know, isms that, that you put into all music radio and, and you try to avoid. Um, but there are some positions left open for request, because we do request in the evening. So those still exist. Oh, the, uh, well, that's determined by the sales department and the management of the radio station. We, on both uh, K-Earth and the Wave, we break twice an hour, okay? We know, we will talk to traffic. Traffic is, are the people who schedule all the commercials. And they'll let us, uh, give us a heads up that we might have uh, seven minute stop sets on, uh, on Monday, but by Wednesday we're gonna have eight minute stop sets, and that's how long they're gonna run. So the music director then sits there and he'll go, okay, we're gonna stop for eight minutes here at 18 past the hour for the first stop set of the hour. Um, and the jock's gonna talk about 90 seconds, so that's how he back times the hour to try to get the songs to time out properly. If he's short, the disc jockeys know to uh, call the music director and say, hey, I need a song. But we have trained all the announcers as well. If you have to drop music because you're running behind, or let's say someone came in, you did an interview, and it, you know, it just ate up too much time that hour, wh what song to drop? Because it's important. If you have, if you have a, um, I'm going to give you a, a, a weird example, not real, real in the real world. We don't want to play too much dance music. Okay, so if you have a disco type record here and a disco type record here and something in the middle, let's say it's a John Cougar Mellencamp song, that's not the one to drop in that situation. You're going to play two, two disco records in a row. And since we know that people have such short listening spans, you have such short opportunities to listen to any one radio station, you will get the wrong impression of what that radio station is. Great program directors make sure that every 15 minutes of the hour, you got a sample of what the radio station's about. So you'll hear some pop on K-Earth, you'll hear some Motown on K-Earth, and you might hear 70s or 80s. You had a question? Yes, in addition to education, how did you prepare for your career? Oh, good, good question. In addition to education, how did I prepare for my career? Uh, I was going to say no education because um, no one's ever asked me if I graduated from the third grade. 
to, to get on the air. I've been on the air, I don't know, 40 some years. I started on the air in commercial radio in my sophomore year in high school. I actually got out of school every day and went on a commercial radio station and played rock and roll. Uh, I was very lucky just because someone liked me. Um, I did go to radio school later though because I didn't like my announcing. Back in those days you learned to puke. It was called puking. <laughs> you lowered your voice, you smiled, and when you do that it sounds like you're about to throw up and that's why they call it puking. Um, and that was the style of announcing in the early 60s. Those days, thank God, they're long gone. Um, so I, I, I did go to a radio school. I went to a technical school because uh, back, back in the day when I got into radio, in order to run the board and the transmitter, you had to be licensed. So you had to have either a third class license, a second class license. Well, you, no one needed a second class, but you had to go through the second class license to get the first class license. First class license took a lot of studying to get there. Um, if it was an FM station, third was fine. In those days, AM was king. And you could operate a single stick AM radio station with a third class license, but most radio stations had two, three, or more towers. And that meant it was directional signal. And you could not operate that without a first class radio license. Radio telephone operator's license, it was called. What else? Yes? You had to give somebody advice on how to create better independent radio, college radio or otherwise. What would you tell them? Okay. Well, the success to talk radio is you have to have magnets as personalities. The person has to be really interesting to the masses, not just to you as the ops manager or program director or the general manager of the radio station. There has to be something going on that they, they entertain and in some cases uh, are intelligent at the same point. There are a lot of talk radio hosts who only entertain. There are others who are very intelligent as well. But you just can't be the expert. That's why so many talk radio stations fail. Can't be the expert. Um, because there are so many radio stations that have on the weekend the auto show and the garden show and those people are experts. The ratings are goose eggs because they're not entertaining. Yet, I'll talk about KNX just as an example. They have Melinda Lee on on the weekends who is a cooking host, but she has a personality. You know, she's kind of like, um, oh, who was the, uh, the French chef, I can't think of her name now. Julia yeah, yeah, Julia Child, who, you know, you watched her even if you weren't interested in cooking because she had such a vivacious personality. Um, and what's missing in most talk radio that where the program directors are not doing their job, you gotta have a storyteller. Some people cannot tell stories. It is amazing how many of us in, in my position in radio today put television people on radio and it just does not work. There are very few people who make that transition. There are fewer people who make the transition from radio to television. Bob Crane, the old Hogan's hero. Uh, geez, I, can't, I used to have a whole list of these people. But they're, they're few and far between. What else? Yeah. How are you integrating uh, the internet and stuff with your radio station? Uh, is, do you see that more as the wave of the future or a coexistence with your on air? It's a pain in the butt to a certain degree. Thank goodness I don't have to do it. We have a web outfit and we also have our IT people who uh, do all of this. Um, Companies, radio companies realize there is money. If you're looking toward the future or future and on the horizon, that there are digital dollars to be had. Okay? Um, and they want a piece of that pie. So you have to have a digital platform. But that doesn't mean just putting up a website, because unless you have content, content drives websites. Something that's really cool and, and will make him tell a friend of his, hey, you should check this out or he'll show it to you, you're not going to succeed at it. Because what's happened today is agents, uh, let's say you're a client and you used to use an agency, uh, you, you sell uh, cars and you hire an agency to place your radio buys. You used to buy three radio stations, maybe a fourth if you thought, well, we should be in country, we should be in you know, this talk station, whatever. That discretionary spending has now gone, I want to try digital, because digital is sexy in today's world. 
You know, they don't know what it means, but they think they want to try it and see if they get any response from it. So that's why Groupon and things like that, 50% half off is a CBS uh, offer that we have. I, I even bought some dinner certificates recently to the Palm because they were half off. You know, but it works. What, un unfortunately, it's, it's line extension and brand extension. And what's going to happen is this is the one that makes all the money, the FM terrestrial signal. The more you send them out, you know, the quicker you're going to suffer on that main, the, the one that pays all the bills. There is, I'm not going to name call letters, there's a rock station here in town who is used to being the top rock station in town. Well, recently, another rock station owned by another company got close and beat them a couple of times. And when I saw the ratings for the, what's usually the number one rock station in town, I went, here's your problem, because you had to go all the way down the page and turn the page and get into the point ones ratings and everything. And on the last page is rock station number one's website getting an audience of a point three. And if they hadn't sent them away to the web, that point three would have been on the FM and they never would have been challenged by station number two. Yeah. So that's why, I, I, as, a, as a program director who grew up in the earlier decades of radio, I have a problem saying, go to the website, go now. No, stay on the FM, because that's where my announcers and myself make, make money. We get bonuses pay, uh, based upon ratings. One-tenth of a rating can make all the difference in the world. The average, you know, we're in meters now, the meter world, where ratings are collected by a device. Arbitron hangs devices on people. And no longer do you have to write down what you hear. If I walk down the hallway and KPCC was playing, it's encoded. That's the, every radio station has an encoded signal. It's collected in this device. Then at night, I put this in a little docking station at home, and it feeds all the data, everything that I was exposed to. Not that I listened to, because I probably didn't even know I was listening to it. It, it heard Coast, who was on at Burger King. I went over there before I have it, coming to class today. And it downloads all that data. And that's how ratings are collected today. The average midday, right now we're in middays in radio, the midday show. The average radio station in the United States today, since we've done electronic measurement, has six meters. So if you're the disc jockey at a radio station in Oklahoma City, you don't want to do anything to cost yourself a meter. That's a lot of percentage that you just lost. That's how critical it is that you hang on to every set of ears that you can. And how do you do that? Don't make mistakes. You know, don't play a song. If the program director lets you pick some of your own songs, oh, this was great. It wasn't a hit, but man, I remember this from my freshman year of college. <laughs> You're going to turn off people. That's why, and I'll, and I'll change the subject now and go into music testing. Uh, radio stations test their music. Uh, we have a music test coming up this week, as a matter of fact. We will get, we hire a research company. They will recruit 100 real people. What the people don't know is the questionnaire will make sure that they do cumulative, cumulative listen to our radio station. They just think it's for Los Angeles radio in general and that all the data will be shared with every radio station. Not true. It's one specific radio station. So we have found people who have a proclivity to listen, let's say, to K-Earth. And what's going to happen is we're going to play 775 songs in one night for these people in a hotel room. Wow. But it's only the hooks. Because believe it or not, all you have to do is hear yesterday and you know the song. You can score it. Those are called hooks. Hooks are never longer than seven seconds. That's all you need to know. And you can uh, develop a score. We do it electronically now, too. You all have wireless devices. It's got a dial on it. It goes from zero to 100. The more you like the song, crank it up. The least you like the song, crank it down. In the next room, we're sitting there with a screen, and on the screen, we can watch the room, meaning the white line will show the whole room, everyone in the room, how the dials are moving from 0 to 100. 
The red line will be women, how they're doing it, just the women alone. The blue line is men. The gray line is uh, younger people, the younger half of the room, the older half. The Hispanics, the blacks, the da 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 So we take all this information. The next day, we have all the information we need. Yes? Well, just I'm kind of based on what you're talking about, and I, I don't want to use the formulaic, but everything's highly structured now, particularly with... It's formulaic. more scientific. Yeah. It's research-based. What do you look for in air checks today? Um, you mean from new talent or yeah. from uh, my existing I mean, talent? Is it more about your ability to voice track and program and edit on the fly, or is it more about you know personality and is it about formatics? I mean, what what would go into an air check? No, because uh, what do I look for in an air check? Um, they don't have to be the air check does not have to be the format I'm doing. If I'm programming K Rock, I might get a great country air check in and go, this guy's good. I'm wondering if he can do rock and I'll put him on in the middle of the night when no one's listening and give them an audition. I always change their name to I usually have them call themselves Hunky Dory or some crazy name and see if they fit. Um, every successful radio station has a sound and when I try pitch jobs I want to be hired as a program director. I produce a radio station. I give it a sound. I created Coast in 1982. I created Love Songs, which is in every market in the United States, and I forgot to copyright it, so I lost all that money. Wouldn't have to, had to work the last 25 years. Um, uh, K-Earth has a sound. So I'm just looking, initially, are the basics there? Secondarily, does it fit our sound? Then when I call the applicant in, you know, do I think they're going to, do they have a big ego? You know, we have great, ta great staffs both on the Wave and K-Earth. Do they, are they going to fit in in the mix, et cetera, et cetera. Half of the battle of getting hired, you guys have got to get a, <clears throat> across the table. When I was an announcer, I'm not a great announcer. But I've been on KISS, I've been on K-Rock, uh, I was on, the, uh, there was a station called 10Q, there was a station called Q102 here in Los Angeles. Um, what else? You know, K-Big Coast, K-Earth mainly because I was there. Um, timing is everything. I have a great sense of timing. I just would bring in the tape for the third time and the, at the reception desk and no one was, you know, the program director was walking by and he happened to remember me because I had applied so many times. Hey Johnny, how's it going? Which impressed me that he remembered my name, but he wasn't going to see me. And then he stopped and came back. He goes, I just had someone quit 20 minutes ago. I can't tell you how many times that's happened. He had a box of tapes, like most program directors or CDs these days, you know, 600 other people in there, of which 599 sounded better than me. But I was there, and I was available. You've got to get across the desk, because if, if I have an opening for an announcer, I grade them A, B, C. Okay? The B's and C's eventually go into the trash can, but I have a box of A's. And I pull them all out every time I have and try to find these people, where are they? Then I regrade those A, B, C. And then I bring in the top three people. You know, if you have two people who are pretty much sound the same, and you, you're always going to go with the chemistry, who you like the best, who you think is going to get along with the staff and they have no idea what the chemistry is unless you meet them in person. So you've got to work them. That's why when, don't, don't take no for an answer. If they tell you no, don't stop applying. And by the way, the person who can get you to me, a person in my position the easiest, is, you heard me speak of her before, Claudia. Find out who the assistant is. Warm up to her. Send her a little you know, a Hershey bar saying, hey, I hope you have a great Thursday. <laughs> you know? She can convince me to give you the break. Uh, he just wants it. He promises seven and a half minutes. That's all he's going to take. You can put a stopwatch on it. He'll be out of your hair. OK, all right, Claudia. For you, I'll do this. Yeah. How difficult is it to get a job as talent? It's more difficult than ever before because of what consolidation's done to radio. It's really sad. Um, I thought I would never program a radio station that had any tracking. I didn't want to track weekends or the all-night show or anything. 
it's just uh, part of the economics of the industry these days. Um, it's more difficult than ever because there aren't openings. And the little stations are all taking syndicated programming. They're plugging a wire in. So I used to tell well, young people like myself when I was in school, I was in Hemet. You know, I went to a little AM directional station that signed off every night, every night at dusk. Um, those opportunities don't exist. There are three difficult times in, a, in an announcer's life. One is getting hired by, at, in, in your first job with only a demo tape. It's not an air check unless it went out over the air. It's a demo. Don't call it an air check if you only have a demo. And there's no shame in having a demo. But now I have to convince this guy who owns a radio station to let me go on his air as a youngster and make all kinds of mistakes because it takes 10,000 hours behind the mic to learn not to make the mistakes. And he, and he has to pay me to, to screw up his radio station. So that's the first difficult time. You will graduate, just like going from middle school to high school, it, from small market to medium market, if you have anything going for you at all, you'll make that transition. The top three markets, really only now New York and Los Angeles, not so much Chicago anymore, it's where the money is. That's the next difficult time. People spend their whole careers trying to do it and don't get the break. And again, I was lucky. I was standing in the right spot at the right time. Otherwise, I might not be here speaking to you today. Uh, so it's, uh, it is difficult. Um, you want people to shoot straight with you. Uh, a lot of program directors, one, most of them won't ever respond. You'll make an application, you'll never hear anything. I think that sucks. And th when I was hired in that instance I was referring to, the program director was a gentleman named Rick Carroll. And I wanted to be on KKDJ, which became KISS. And uh, Rick went on to program K-Rock as well, and Rock of the 80s back then. Whenever I would write him a note or leave a tape, he would always write back a personal letter. And he always referred to one thing on the tape, so I knew he really listened to it. I really enjoyed the set. Sounded like you were having fun when you did this or that. And I told myself, I only want to be a disc jockey. I never want to be a program director. If I ever become a program director, I'm going to do that. And I do that every single time for decades. You send me something, you're going to get something in return. I'm going to prove to you that I listened to it. Um, he always remembered my name. I had a guy who applied for a job recently. He sent out 99 resumes. He got two responses. Only two. And by the way, this guy was in Oklahoma City. It was no small market disc jockey. Uh, one was a mimeograph kind of thing where they wrote the name on a blank line, Dear Robert, thanks for your tape and resume. Uh, the other one was a personal letter. That was for me. And this is how it paid off for me. Uh, one day I needed, uh, I was working in El Paso. I had to cut my teeth in El Paso, Texas so, to learn programming. So I'm out there, I need a morning man desperately because I'm working both morning and afternoon drive and killing myself plus doing all the production. Um, so uh, I call anyone who's looking for jobs in the trades. Back then, they would also list people looking for jobs. I call this guy. Robert Scott, he goes, Johnny K, you don't know who I am. I'm not interested in coming to El Paso. But I sent out 99 resumes, and, and only, and he told me the two examples. He goes, so I'm going to do you a favor. There is this guy in Seattle. He's really good. He's not looking around, but he'd be perfect for you. And that's how it paid off. And this guy, I ended up taking from El Paso to Chicago when I went to Chicago and to Los Angeles. So you never know how you can get the job. That's why I, I tell you, keep chipping away at it without being a pest. You got to time these things. Because uh, it will pay off. It's like being an actor. I don't understand waiters who don't tell every customer, I want to be an actor. They have no idea I do television commercials that I cast. And I probably will never use you in a commercial. But if someone says, hey, I, I need, man, a tall looking kind of goofy kid. We're doing this commercial for Hush Puppy Shoes. I know this kid. He works at Bob's Big Boy. I think he's an actor. He might still be there. It's usually that kind of little networking thing 
that pays off for you. So leave no stone unturned. And don't be afraid, please. This is what's wrong with the current generation. Don't, the actor example. State your intention. Tell everyone what it is you want to do. So many of us are introverts in this, I am too, an introvert in this world, and we stay at home thinking someone's going to call us or email us or knock on the door and give us a job. It's not going to happen. You got to go out. You got to explore. And when you've been told no once, it doesn't mean no forever. Keep trying. What else would you like to know? Yes? What's a realistic career path for any one of these students you hire as a board operator? And when would you tell them time to move on to the next thing you're not going to go with? Them? What's a realistic uh, career path for someone who might be hired as a board operator? I'm ashamed to say that here in 2011, we still pay board operators $10 an hour what? at most places. It was $5 an hour when I started in radio in 1966. Um, I tried to recently get some $10 an hour board operators who have been with us for years a raise and couldn't. Not, not a quarter. Okay, that's how tightly the money is being watched these days. So oftentimes the board operators will come into my office shyly because they don't deal with me all the time. Do you have a million, you know, talking? Sure, of course, sit down, close the door, what, what do you want? And they'll, you know, they'll ask for the raise. I tell them I'll try to get the raise, and I go and knock on the doors and have the conversations I need to have. And when I'm turned down, then I, I tell them the, the sad news. And then I advise them, it's time to go do something else. You want to be on the air? You aren't going to go from board operator in m most likely cases. You're not going to go from board operator in Los Angeles to weekends in Los Angeles. Because we have people who have been in the industry 30 years who are begging to be do weekends in Los Angeles. Because it's Los Angeles. It's union. It's got benefits, et cetera. It's the big time, quote unquote. Um, it's like the mother bird uh, pushing the baby out of the nest. You just got have to do that sometimes. And that's where many people, as I said at the beginning of the hour, uh, get discouraged and want to leave the industry. It's good they found out that quick as a board op. Yes? Um, what about um, radio personalities? I understand that it's um, based on perhaps your um, history, like a lot of celebrities move into announcing positions. But for those announcers who are new in the field, what do they usually start off with in respect to pay? Oh, in, restrict, in respect to pay, what do you start at? Minimum wage. You know, back when, when Victorville had, and Palmdale, and, and uh, Monterey, and places like that, and Palm Springs had live announcers and small radio stations. Minimum wage, you know, if you would be lucky today, you might get 10 to 12 an hour, I would guess. Uh, you're going to starve. And, and, and back when it was... Uh, uh, an industry filled with announcers. I used to tell people, you know, talk to the guys in particular, don't get married because you're going to, announcers in those days, you needed to always, and don't own a house, just rent an apartment and park a U-Haul with a car pointing out because you're going to change jobs. You're going to get fired. You're going to want to move on and everything. And when you have a family, especially if you have children too, they don't want to go and you have to go. I know uh, one announcer, and I'd only been in the industry uh, nine years, he had already been at 32 radio stations. It wasn't uncommon, you know, that's the way it was. Um, in Los Angeles now, if you get to a union radio station, if I were to hire you and have you just read a PSA every day, that's all, you know, two sentences. Uh, I have to give you somewhere around $90,000 a year to start you. That's because there's a union contract. Non-union radio stations in Los Angeles, that could be as low as 35000 So that's where it goes. I'm really proud to say that I don't have any announcers at scale. They're all over scale. In fact, I'm the only scale guy because I do the all-night show. But luckily, I get paid to be a program director, too. What does that mean, but, over scale, scale? What does that mean? Okay, if the radio station, if, if AFTRA is the union for radio and television, uh, 
if after it negotiates a contract on behalf of the bargaining unit, which are the announcers on the radio station, if they come up with 75,000, and that's the minimum you can hire anyone who works a five-day week, or a six-day, depending on the contract, then it doesn't matter how little I work here, I gotta pay you the 75 grand. Overscale means, no, I've got all my announcers. We, I cut individual contracts with them, and they're higher than scale. So they're making 11250 or whatever. Yeah. So that's possible. It's a young person's business. At least it used to be. It no longer is, actually. Um, a quick story. I, I predicted in 1999 that the industry was getting fried. Because every year, I'm a UCLA grad, every year UCLA has career night in the student union. And they put up these big you know, tables and, and where you can, like banquet tables where 15 people can sit. Um, and they have UCLA graduates at career night, which is put on by the students themselves. So Carol Burnett, who went to UCLA, would represent actors. And this person represents management and makeup. And, nah, nah. and I was radio. I've always been radio. And the students are allowed to come with tapes, CDs, whatever, resumes, photos, 8 by 10s And they just drift from table to table and listen, ask a few questions, drop off their stuff if they want to leave it behind. And it's usually a two-hour event that sometimes goes as long as three hours, depending on how much interest there is. I never, there are 15 seats that fit around the table. I've never had a problem having at least 12 people around that, that table until 1999. And then I went to my boss the next day after this event and said, radio is done. And he goes, why? I said, well, there's this event I do all the time. I sat there for two hours. I had three people come to my table. Two wanted to know how to get their songs played on radio. And one <laughs> wanted to be a newscaster, not an announcer. And I told my management then, the word is out. This is no longer fun. This has become a business and an industry. And young people know it. And that's sad. That's really sad. There is no more farm league, the Victorvilles of the world, where you can go and learn the craft. You've you got to weasel your way in, or you have to mentor someone, shadow someone. I have a kid who I saw, he, he drives our van, one of our vans for the radio station. The other, a couple of months ago I saw him, he was just kind of walking through the hall, and he looked really sad. And I went, hey, what's up? You know, I shook his hand, I said, hey, I want to thank you for everything we do, you, you do. And uh, I said, you want to have lunch? Let's go have lunch. So a bunch of us took him to lunch. And he was amazed that, you know, we were going to have a lunch. I said, what is it you want to do? He has no intention. I thought he was... 18, 19, he's 28, he looks really young. He has a wife, and he has no idea what he wants to do. So I, I advised him, take the whole weekend, lay on the beach, get away with a yellow tablet, write down anything. Even if you don't really think you want to be an actor, if that's it, write it down, just make no, no, notes for three days, and then whittle that sucker down and see if there's something that turns you on. Turns out that he wants to be, uh, go into engineering. So. I went to our chief engineer and said, hey, there's this guy, he only drives the van, he needs some help. Will you just, and he, he'll just gladly just follow you around, take a, drive him up to the transmitter, show him what, he just wants to watch you solder wires and, and learn what he can. And that's what, what this kid's going to have to do to make it. And I think he's going to make it because he's there every day, no money, except for when he drives for us, and he's saying, I want to do this. And that's the passion I was telling you about. I got paid $5.75, $5.25 an hour when I started, but I thought I was making $15 an hour because I knew being behind a microphone on a commercial radio station had value in it. Just like if you want to be a television newscaster, you may think you're ready to be on Channel 9 or Channel 2 do doing the news here in town. There's nothing wrong with doing cable TV in Orange County to get that experience, even if you're interning to do it. You know, we all pay dues. Yes? You have connections with CBS stations around the country, right? I'm part of the CBS family. I like that. So if somebody <laughs> graduated from here, would that be that difficult to get CBS to, to maybe send you to one of their stations to get hooked up there? I mean, is that, like, completely out of the... 
Well, the way CBS works these days is, we, uh, uh, and you might want to write this down, um, we, as program directors, we're not even supposed to take the CDs anymore. You know, we're told that we have to send everyone to a clearinghouse of talent with cbsradio.com. There you navigate to the Career Center page. There you can create an account under your name. And there you can upload your resume and everything. And when I have an opening, I'm supposed to go to the Career Center and say, I got an opening for this. Send me some apps. They want, because they want to track them. It's important that you know, licensees of radio stations prove to the FCC that they're, they're trying to reach as many people in the community whenever we do have an opportunity. I have no problem with people sending me things directly, but the jobs are, all the jobs in the company are supposed to be posted there. But that's not going to start the relationship up. So if a student uh, came into the Pasadena, but they're really from Milwaukee, and there's a CBS radio station there. Try to get, you know, next time you're back home on vacation or whatever, you know, call and say, hey, can I come in? For a tour even, you know. You just, you got to get in front of the person. You got to shake their hand. This does something, you know, especially if they look at you in the eye. It's hard to forget people. You might not remember the name, but if you see them again, don't I know you? And now he can say, yeah, I was, I was taking a Christmas vacation last year, and I came in. I'm the guy who brought your secretary a Hershey bar. Oh, yeah, that, OK. Yeah, what's going on, Greg? No? What else? Come on, that can't be it. There are questions you want to ask, and you're just afraid to. Don't be afraid. There are no dumb questions. Yes? Um, would be getting into television have some similar requirements as getting into radio in terms of interacting with the people there or other such things? Oh, I never had a job myself in a television station, so all of this would be speculation. Um, I think it's still about relationships. So much of all the, um, try to get into the film industry. That is, you know, that's everyone's uh, nephew, niece, and cousin who gets the breaks. Uh, you got to know people, you know. But not only do you have to know them, they have to know, what, again, state your intention, what you want. I want to be a director one day. I'd love to be a technical director somewhere. So I would think myself, we just did Wave Fest, which is a concert at the Greek Theater, and they have the jumbo big screens, you know, that if you want to be a technical director or a director, that's one of the first jobs to aim for. How do you get that job so that you can get the demo tape showing how you, you know, selected shots on that uh, Tina Turner concert over the weekend or whatever? Yes? Uh, two questions. Uh, first, what is the automation system that's used by CBS? Mm -hmm. And secondly, how much work is there in production at um, from the wave. Oh, okay. Good questions. What, uh, what automation system do we use? It's called Audio Vault. Uh, Clear Channel uses a, a system called Profit. And basically, they do the same thing. You know, uh, they just play out you know, the songs and the commercials in order and the jingles. And if your voice track is going to play over the intro of the song, it knows take the song down this amount of dBs until your voice track finishes and bring it back up. And, uh, and how much work is there in terms of production? Generally speaking. Yeah, generally speaking. Well, here in a large market, usually there's one production guy or girl in a radio station. She's doing all the commercials, all the station promos, talking about the contests and the, the you know, disc jockeys on the air and the imaging of the radio station. When you get into a market this size, we have an imaging director and a production director. The production director does all the commercials even just loading commercials that come in from clients that are fully produced. The imaging director is the one who, he's the only person, Keith Smith is our imaging director, who gets to produce the promos, talk about Hawaii every day, you know, or, or uh, Christina Kelly makes every Tuesday night a K-Earth HD Tuesday, and uses the station voice. We use one voice for the, to be, represent the station, and do those sweepers and things that you hear on the air, and they're rejoiners, we call them. And then there are various voices that we use for commercials. Our commercial guy, as a matter of fact, is Jay Gardner. And Jay is, you hear him every night on television, because at the end of David Letterman, he's the one who goes, worldwide pants. 
I'm not wearing any pants and that kind of stuff. Get this. This is, this is a good story about technology. David Letterman, when he first hired Jay to do the show, was so afraid of technology and didn't trust it that he flew Jay from LA to New York all the time to do it live on stage. To you in your careers. Okay, I really appreciate it.